Hello, everybody. Welcome to our broadcast this week. Uh, this is Keystone Church. I'm Pastor Steve Green. My wife Penny and I pastor here, and this message is for Sunday, March 24th. Our title is Being a Friend of God, and we're talking about righteousness, the kind of righteousness that comes by faith. Let's read James chapter 2 and verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So when we talk about righteousness, it helps to sort out a few uh, potential difficulties. Uh, there are two types, well, more than two, but when it comes to righteousness by faith, there are two types of righteousness by faith. When we, when we first receive Jesus, when we ask him to be the Lord of our life, when we become a Christian, we're born again. We become a new creature in Christ Jesus, uh, and we take on, and this new creation that we are, we have a new identity. We are a new person, and we have the identity of righteousness and that is righteousness by faith. Uh, and that's one of the two uh, types of righteousness by faith. Having become righteous now and having the identity of righteousness, we are now motivated to use our faith to live righteously. And that also is called righteousness. It's righteousness by faith. Uh, the first is an identity. The second is a lifestyle. And the same is true with the word justified. When we uh, receive that righteousness, we should say this, that the word justified and the word righteousness, they're, one's a verb and one's a noun. Uh, so the, grammatically, they're, they're different in that respect, but they come from the same word family. Um, meaning that they are referring to the same thing. To be justified is simply the verb uh, for uh, righteousness, meaning that justified could be translated made righteous, and it is, would have exactly the same meaning. And so just as righteousness has two different applications, righteousness by faith has two different applications, so it is justified. When we are made righteous in the new birth, we have now been justified. We've been made right with God. That happens in an instant, in the blink of an eye, in the moment that we receive Jesus uh, as we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Uh, also, though, the word justified refers to the process of you and I becoming obedient. As we are obedient, as we are by faith uh, living righteously, we are now being justified. In this sense, we are being found to be righteous in terms of our behaviors, our actions, our hard attitude. We are found to be a righteous man, uh, and so we are being justified. Uh, so it's these double applications we have to be alert to. Uh, sometimes uh, we might be different groups, different uh, streams of Christianity might uh, emphasize one of these over the other, or even be aware of just one of these over the other. Some might be aware of the identity of righteousness, of being justified in the new birth, um, but unaware uh, that there is a lifestyle of righteousness that we can be justified in our behavior, or it could be vice versa. What we need, uh, emphatically what we need, is to be aware of both, because both play a very large role, and it's going to assist us greatly um, to understand that we have been given uh, have been given the gift of righteousness. This plays a key role in our practice of righteousness. It plays a key role in making a distinction between the difference between righteousness by faith and righteousness by law. Righteousness by faith is going to be greatly assisted by understanding that we have been given the gift of righteousness. Therefore, we're not trying to get righteousness from God, but rather we're responding with gratitude, uh, thanksgiving, appreciation, love for what he's done for us, and, and we want to please him, we want to follow him, and so there's a flow of righteousness that comes, and, and that would be the righteousness that is by faith. So, uh, 
There are benefits, and we, in previous weeks, we've listed these benefits. Two weeks ago, we had 22 bullet points. Uh, last week, we shortened it, but these, all of these bullet points were various benefits that come through the practice of righteousness by faith. Uh, so we want, certainly, to not only be aware of the identity of righteousness, but we also want to be aware of the uh, function of righteousness, because that is where the blessing is. It is in the second one. That is where there is the the full flow of God's provision and favor, His care, His blessing in our life. And so uh, we won't review those again this week, but just, just mention them briefly. And again, it's going to come by the practice of righteousness by faith. So we need to know the distinction between the two. There are a number of different distinctions. The one we're emphasizing this week is the fact that we have been given the identity of righteousness in the first place, if if we are aware of that, conscious of that, if that's in our heart, if we believe it, if it's been woven into the fabric of our consciousness, uh, then then it's going to be stimulating the righteousness that comes from faith in terms of behavior. Uh, so let's read James chapter two verses twenty one to twenty four. Was not Abraham our father justified by works uh, when he offered Isaac? There's justified, and in this case, it's justified by works, which I think you are alert to this. You're immediately aware that's that's a good justification. Abraham was justified by works. It's going to be the second of the two that we mentioned earlier. This is the justification that is part of our lifestyle. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his work? and by works faith was made perfect. And so he had faith previously, but now with this particular work, it was a perfection of his faith. And then verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We'll read where that scripture comes from. That's an Old Testament scripture. Of course, we're reading now in James, which is in the New Testament. uh, And it's quoting, James is quoting that Old Testament scripture. Let me read it again. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, this righteousness being referred to um, here was the righteousness of identity, that righteousness that comes when a person first believes. We'll see that when we read the account in in Genesis. Just while we're here on this word righteousness, I want to point out it's the Greek word dikiosune. Um, If those that have an outline can see it printed there. Um, And And I want to draw your attention to the fact how similar this word is to the word justified, which we'll read in just a moment. Uh, It says, finishing verse 23, and he was called the friend of God. And then verse 24, you see then that a man is justified, and this is the word dikayao. And so my point I'm making is the word righteousness appears uh, in English superficially to be very different from the word justified. There, There are two completely different words. They're spelled completely different ways. They have no similarity in appearance in English. However, in Greek, uh, justified is dikayao. Uh, in Greek, uh, righteousness is dikayasune. And so they are very similar in appearance. One is longer than the other. One's a noun, one's a verb. But the point I'm making is they're the same word family. They mean exactly the same thing. So here's the point. I want you to know that to be justified and to be made righteous are not two different things spiritually, but they are identically the same thing. That helps us. That simplifies things. And so it says in verse 24, again, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And so so here James is emphasizing the second of the two types of righteousness, or the second of the two types of justification. He's referring to Genesis 15, verses 5 and 6. Let's read that. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now uh, toward heaven. This is God bringing Abraham outside and saying to him, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And God said to Abraham, So shall your descendants be. So this is a profound promise. It's a profound moment in Abraham's life. Uh, And it says in verse 6, And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, accounted it to him 
for righteousness. So there was a simple thing that happened here. Abraham believed the promise God made, and because he believed the promise, um, it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so that would be uh, an accounting of righteousness. Uh, It's righteousness now is attributed to Abraham simply because he believed what God said. In this case, there is no particular action. This is where Abraham was justified in the sight of God in the first place. So uh, there's two different points of time that we're considering here. Uh, when we consider Genesis 5, or 15 rather, in verse 6, and also what we read in James, so there was the point in time when God led Abraham outside uh, in the night and he saw the stars. God said, so shall your descendants be. Abraham believed him. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Roughly 25 years later, we don't know exactly, but it would have been somewhere in that generation time frame. Now Isaac has been born. Isaac is now a young man. And now God has commanded Abraham to take Isaac to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him there. And Abraham did that only as he was about to sacrifice him. God said Abraham called him, called his name and pointed out there was a ram with its horns caught in a thicket. And um, and then God instructed Abraham to sacrifice uh, that ram instead. And so, uh, but but Abraham was willing to obey God, and and this is where um, <clears throat> James is saying, uh, and that it was by works that Abraham was justified when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. And so this was 25 years later. But even though there's been that long um, duration of time between when uh, righteousness was first. A, counted to Abraham, and now when he's offering Isaac, his son, on the altar, even though there's been 25 years, um, the scripture tells us that, that uh, by, this, by, these, by this work of, of what Abraham was doing, his faith is now made perfect. The same faith that believed God 25 years ago is now been perfected by the action that is happening on Mount Moriah. And not only that, but the scripture which said that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, which was a completed action at the time, it was truly it was truly accounted uh, to Abraham for righteousness. When when he looked up and saw the stars in the sky, it was in that moment when he believed God that it was accounted to him for righteousness. That being true, it is also true that 25 years later, when he was willing to offer his son Isaac, that that same scripture was fulfilled. And so there's a duality here, and and it's a a challenge to our faith. It's a necessity for us to believe both and understand they're both equally true. Uh, So then, uh, what we're seeing in this scripture is that um, Abraham was justified by faith uh, when he looked at that night, when he looked up into the night sky. Uh, He was justified by faith. Uh, He was made righteous uh, that night. And then 25 years later, roughly, he was also justified by faith when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Wow. So there's, to say that Abraham was justified by faith is referring to two different events. One uh, is built on top of the other. Because it was accounted to Abraham for righteousness in the first place, he, <clears throat> he now had a basis for trusting and obeying God. Uh, so, uh, and it was in that, it was in the second of the two, uh, that he was called the friend of God. So, so as we pointed out earlier, uh, the, this whole broad spectrum of blessing and benefit, including being called a friend of God, comes with uh, not only being, having righteousness accounted to us, but then when we act upon that in obedience to God, it is in that action of faith where faith is perfected, where the scripture is fulfilled. It is in that moment that we receive the, the full outpouring of God's blessing on our life. Praise the Lord. So if we come back to Romans chapter 1 now, verses 16 and 17, uh, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. I mean, there's just so many potent words in these two verses we're going to read, verses 16 and 17 of Roman, 
Romans 1, the word gospel is a potent word. The word salvation, power is a potent word. Salvation is a potent word. And then it's for everyone who believes, so it's by faith. Um, he's just hitting so many um, critical buttons here. He says, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Then in verse 17, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith and so paul is now saying the same thing that james was saying is that uh we are there is uh an initial faith what paul says is we go from faith to faith what does that mean it means that initially there is the faith by which we are saved uh by that faith We have now righteousness accredited to us or accounted to us. We are justified in that moment. That's our initial faith. And then Paul's describing what he means by quoting from Habakkuk, the just, that's just by faith, justified by faith. The just shall now live by faith. And so that's why he says we go from faith to faith. There's the faith we're saved by, and then there's the faith we live by. And the faith we live by is the kind that produces righteousness righteousness. Uh, It's being justified by faith in the second sense. It's being made righteous in the second sense, in our behavior, in our actions, in our attitudes. We know that it is righteousness that we live by because he says, for in it, uh, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So how is the righteousness of God revealed? It's revealed in us. It's revealed in our actions. It's revealed in what we think, what we say, what we do, in our attitudes. Uh, This is how the righteousness of God is revealed. This is how we live. And so there's the duality of justification or the duality of righteousness that we find here in Romans 1 and verses 16 to 17. Praise the Lord. And so all of this is the gospel. Sometimes we think the gospel is just the the part about getting saved, but the part about uh, righteousness by works, righteousness by obedience, righteousness by faith uh, that that obeys. uh, In this, we are also saved in a different way in terms of having, as we mentioned, 22 bullet points, these many different ways the blessing of God comes upon our life. This is also called salvation. So, so, So gospel is a bigger word than what we sometimes have thought it to be. It rightfully refers to uh, how we get saved in the first place, but it also rightfully refers to how we now walk with God. All of it is the gospel. All of it is righteousness by faith, and all of it um, is salvation. Different aspects or facets of salvation, but it is. If we come to Romans 3 now, we're going to follow a few verses through Romans, but now in, in Romans 3 verse 21 to 24, and again, we're, we're, we're um, <clears throat> documenting this, these, uh, the dual nature of justification or the dual nature of righteousness. And we're just seeing how both are important and how both are emphasized in Scripture and how one leads to the other. Again, the key thought today is what does righteousness by faith look like? How does it work? How is it different than righteousness by law? Righteousness by law brings a curse. Righteousness by faith brings a blessing. Therefore, we need to know the difference. Uh, And so what is righteousness by faith? Well, first of all, it is the identity, but then having been given the identity, having been loved by God, uh, it is our response of faith toward Him, our love back to Him in which we want to follow Him, please Him, help Him, do what He says, be faithful to Him. Uh, And then in that, we uh, perform righteousness. It is it is a behavior, uh, and and that and, and and so the the initial identity becomes a platform for us, a spiritual platform to stand on, uh, whereby we may now function righteously. So Romans three verses twenty one to twenty four. But now the righteousness of God uh, apart from the law. So this is a distinction now between by faith and law. The righteousness of God apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, there it is emphasized again, through faith in Jesus Christ 
to all and on all who believe. And so this simple, uh, the simple reality of believing in Jesus in the first place, accepting him as our Lord, inviting him to be uh, our guide and master in life, that simple act of faith uh, causes the righteousness of God to be uh, to us and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace. So again, we're seeing how the word righteousness is used in concert with the word justified. One's a noun, one's a verb, and they're referring to exactly the same thing. And in this case, the emphasis is on that initial identity that we receive when we first trust in Jesus. Uh, We see that continue in the next chapter, Romans 4 and verse 1. Uh, Paul says, what then shall we say that Abraham, now Paul is referring to Abraham in the same same way that James did, Uh, What shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, okay, now this, this is where some can get a little bit confused, but follow me here, because James said that Abraham was justified by works, but, but James is emphasizing the lifestyle of righteousness, whereas Paul here is emphasizing the initial entrance into righteousness. He says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So this is amazing. Paul is quoting the same verse that James did, but they're, but they're drawing two different meanings out of that same verse. Um, James was emphasizing the lifestyle of righteousness and, and using this verse, but here Paul is uh, emphasizing the, um, the identity of righteousness. Uh, <clears throat> he says, now to him who works, And this would be works of law now, so he's distinguishing between law and faith. Uh, Now to him who works, the wages are counted, uh, not counted as grace, but of debt. So if somebody works somebody for 40, works for 40 hours in a week for somebody and they, for a certain hourly uh, rate and they get paid at the end of the week according to that hourly rate, that is not a gift from the um, employer. That is not the employer being gracious to the employee, but rather it is a debt owed to the employee because they have worked for it. A simple point that Paul is making. Uh, but to him in verse 5 he says, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies or makes righteous the ungodly. So clearly the, um, the meaning that Paul is getting at here is referring to the initial uh, granting of accrediting or accounting of righteousness to a person who up to this point has been ungodly. So th- there is no work of righteousness being done here. They are ungodly. They are not working, but they ha- are nevertheless being justified by faith. He says, now to him who believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as it was with Abraham in the first place. So, so, but then, but then uh, James uses the same scripture, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he is demonstrating how 25 years later this same scripture is now fulfilled. Um, Abraham's faith is now perfected in the fact that he is now uh, willing to offer his son Isaac on the altar. Uh, Praise the Lord. Uh, We are justified uh, apart from works in the first place, and after we have been justified apart from works, we are now justified by works, and there is no contradiction. The two work hand in hand. So we continue in Romans 5 and verse 1, therefore having been justified by faith. So, so this is in the past tense. This is not a work that God is working presently working out in the lives of the Roman Christians. This is something that has already been done. It's finished. It's completed. So clearly it's referring to the identity of righteousness. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 5 and verse 9, much more than having now been justified. So again, not referring to an ongoing process of justification, but referring to a finished work, having now been justified uh, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And then uh, in verse 
chapter six now. And so we're just continuing, we're, we're rolling through Romans. Uh, in verse 12 of chapter 6, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. So, so uh, the emphasis for, uh, uh, for a number of chapters now has been on the identity of righteousness, the free gift of righteousness, being justified freely by His grace. But now, uh, in the book of Romans, the, the writer Paul is transitioning. Well, seeing as you have that basis of justifying, of justification in your life. Now let's be uh, building on that. Let's be justified by our faith expressing itself through love for other people, love for God, uh, fidelity to God, faithfulness to God, obedience to God. He says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Verse 13, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And the grace being spoken of here is the grace that empowers a person to a righteous lifestyle. And so uh, because they're not under law, but they're under grace, meaning they have the power to be righteousness, the writer is saying, let's go ahead and do it. Uh, verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? He says, certainly not. Obviously, the purpose of grace is not to... Um, cater to a continued lifestyle of sin, but rather its purpose is to empower a new lifestyle of righteousness. Uh, he says in verse 16, do you not know, so this is speaking to people that are already Christians, people who have been justified, who have the identity of righteousness. He says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey. So it is entirely possible for a person to be a child of God and justified and still be a slave to the devil. Uh, <clears throat> he goes on to say, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So there is sin potentially in the life of a believer. There is spiritual death that can dominate the life of a believer. Uh, <clears throat> to illustrate this um, duality, it might seem uh, to some like still there's, this is difficult. There's a contradiction here. You're saying that we're initially justified not by works, emphasis, strong emphasis on not by works. And then after that, we are justified by works, <laughs> strong emphasis on works. It was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Um, but it's, it's not that difficult. Um, a good illustration might be, let's take the U.S. president, um, not, not the current president, but just the office of president in general. Uh, the way that office is filled is you get different people who run for president. There's an election. You have uh, a person who's elected president. They now become president-elect after a couple or three months, two or three months, they are then inaugurated, they take the oath of office, and now they are instituted into the office of president. This person now, uh, they sit down, perhaps in their oval office behind that desk, and they haven't done anything yet, they haven't done any function of president yet, uh, but they now have the office of president. They have the position. They have the identity of president. They are the president of the United States. They're not 90% the president. They're not 95%. They are 100% the president of the United States. They have the, the identity of that office, even though they haven't done a thing. That would be similar to you and I having the identity of righteousness, even when we haven't done a thing, uh, in our case, to deserve it. But then the purpose of a person occupying the office of the president is to then do the functions of the president. In fact, they cannot even begin to do the functions of a president until they have the office of the president. So uh, these two things are not only not con contradictory uh, to one another, but they complement one another. They both require each other. Um, the, to be elected president would be a waste if a person did not do the functions of president. And in order to do the functions of a, the president, a person, person must 
first of all be elected uh, and, and installed as the President of the United States. And so um, that is, that's not a difficult thing to see. There's the, the position, the identity, and then there's the function, and the two go hand in hand. The same is true for righteousness, or the same is true for uh, justification. Uh, we are, uh, we could even say if the president does good things, that he is justified <laughs> in his function as president um, as we are when we're obedient to the Lord. So then now, uh, moving on to Romans 8, we're just going to, this will be the last passage in Romans uh, that we look at, verses 13, 14, we'll, we'll skip verse 15 and then read verses 16 and 17. For if you live then, uh, but according to the flesh, you will die, which is just, this is chapter eight. This is the same thing we read in chapter six. He says, uh, as a Christian, he says, you can be obedient to sin leading to death, spiritual death. So he says now in verse 13 of chapter eight, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He's speaking about the practice of righteousness. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. So when we, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, uh, this is what Paul is calling being led by the Spirit. Boy, this can help us tremendously when it, you know, being led by the Spirit can take on a lot of different forms in a lot of different people's minds. And sometimes it can go completely off the rails from what the uh, Scripture teaches. But if our focus, first of all, in being led by the Spirit is the practice of righteousness, we, that will go a long ways by itself to helping us properly discern and recognize the voice of the Spirit as it pertains to everything else in our life. Um, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, this would be those who by the Spirit are putting to death the deeds of the body. If you can hear the Holy Spirit uh, help you put to death the deeds of your body, if you're willing to listen to that voice, then it's far more likely that you will uh, be willing to or able to hear that voice as it pertains to other things. Uh, we've already done the hard thing. Uh, in verse 15, uh, the Spirit, or sorry, verse 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, in verse 17, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him. So what kind of suffering are we talking about? A very specific, precise kind of suffering, and that is the suffering that comes from being led by the Spirit, which is putting to death by the Spirit, putting to death the deeds of our body. So this is uh, entirely focused on the practice of righteousness, being justified in our actions. Praise the Lord. Uh, if we, then if we, uh, if we indeed suffer with Him, then we will be glorified together. So now, uh, coming back to our main thought again today, what is the difference between righteousness by law and righteousness uh, by faith? Um, here, are some, here are some thoughts. Righteousness by faith is knowing that we have already been justified, believing that we are justified. We already have right standing with God. We're not trying for it. Our good actions are not because we're trying to get to this place with God, but because we believe that we're already there. He's already loved us. He's already given us righteousness. We're simply responding in faith and love back to Him. That just is a whole uh, entirely different um, platform to be working off of. It's a whole different standing in our consciousness that we have with God. We're operating out of gratitude uh, toward God. So, so righteousness by faith means that we are trusting Him and that here's a second key characteristic and it's, and it's part of the passage we just read is that we yield. So two key characteristics of righteousness by faith distinguishing the difference between righteousness by law is righteousness by faith already believes that we are righteous, number one, and number two, we can trust God, we can surrender, we can yield to Him, we can, we can can make room, we can get out of the way, we can listen, we can um, esteem what God is telling us greater than whatever our, 
our flesh might be telling us. And so we uh, make room for him. And, and that yielding is enabling, it's permitting, it's um, allowing the Holy Spirit to flow in us. And we're now doing righteousness, not by our flesh, which is righteousness by law, but we're doing righteousness by the power of the Spirit. And this needs to be practiced. It doesn't come automatically automatically. It doesn't necessarily come easily all the time because there's a small degree of suffering that is related to it, putting to death by the Spirit. But the amazing thing is by the Spirit we can put to death the deeds of the body, whereas by our flesh we cannot put to, to death the deeds of the body. So we are empowered to do this. We can do it. Um, and, and by doing so we become full participants in God's blessing and plan for our life. Uh, which is a far, far, far greater blessing than whatever suffering is involved with it. But we have to have the faith to go through this suffering. If we don't uh, put to death the deeds of the body, then by, by, by uh, abandoning this whole provision, the smorgasbord of blessing God has for us, we end up suffering much in a much greater way by trying to live without this blessing of God upon our lives. So the choice, there is no choice, unfortunately, to have, the, there is no non-suffering way. But what we do have a choice in is, do we want the small suffering way or do we want the big suffering way? That is our choice. And to those who have the faith to accept the small suffering way, then we have the power and the blessing of the Holy Spirit in our life. Praise the Lord. Well, we'll, we'll stop right there. Thank you for, your, for following uh, us in this, in, this, in this thing today. I know for, for some it might appear like this is just hard to grasp. Um, is that, you know, this duality, uh, two different ways of being justified, two different ways of being righteous. Um, but again, I think I trust that it's clear and plain to you that, that they don't oppose one another. They don't con contradict one another. In fact, they fit and flow together. Both are necessary because we have the identity of righteousness that gives us faith to pursue the function of righteousness. And working together, uh, we enter into the fullness of God's plan for us. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being with us today.